And one of the things that the Bible teaches us is we need to be discerning of times and seasons. One of the reasons why people miss their inheritance in Christ is often because they don't recognize the times and the seasons. That's why the Bible talks about a tribe in Israel calls them the sons of Issachar. It says they were in command of their brethren. Why? Because they had an understanding of the times. I want us to understand that every time God brings us into a new season, especially into the middle of the year, it is not just the flipping of the calendar. As we flip the calendar, we need to realize that God's intention is to bring us much more into a new season. And I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice on site and online. That in every area of your life, let the new emerge. In the name of Jesus. You know, one of the things Jesus said is, if you want to experience the new, you have to create room for the new. He said, nobody pours new wine into old wine skin. Or else, you're going to lose the wine and you're going to lose the wine skin. Because when you want to experience newness, there is a disposition that makes newness possible. One of the things I would encourage us to do in the next five days as we begin tonight is to have that disposition that makes the new possible. Because if you want to experience the new, as a matter of fact, let me say this here, when we're talking about a revival, we are not talking about the repetition of the old. In that sense, and I'm going to make that clear as time passes. In Psalm 35 and verse 6, the Bible says, Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? One of the things that announces a revival is fullness of joy. That's why Jesus said in John 16 and verse 24, he said, act until your joy is full. He said, up until now, you have not asked anything in my name. He said, ask until your joy is full. And here the psalmist is saying, will you not revive us again that we may rejoice? I love the way the uh, Passion Translation puts it. It says, revive us again, O God. I know you will. It says, give us a fresh start. Then all your people will taste your joy and gladness. TPT, the passion translation. It says, give us a fresh start. So when we're talking about a revival, we're talking about a fresh start. The opportunity to begin again. I remember saying this on Sunday, that every time you look at a year, the least approach you can have to any year, right, is to see two years in one year. So in spite and regardless of what may have happened in the first half, when you step into the month of July, it's like having a fresh start. It's like beginning the year afresh. It simply means whatever mistake you may have made between January and June, you now have the privilege and the opportunity to make corrections. It simply means whatever goals you may have set, and probably those goals have not become a reality, you now have another opportunity to go after those goals again. Whether they are spiritual goals, you know, whether they are occupational goals, financial goals, ministerial goals, you know, social goals, health goals. I want to make something clear tonight because when you hear about certain words, especially in this part of the world, people have different meanings attached to it. I did this last year and I feel impressed to do it again to clarify what is a revival. Because most times, especially if you grew up in a religious background, when you hear of revival, you think of a crusade for sinners. None of us understand what I'm talking about. You know, especially if you grew up in the kind of denomination where I grew up, that there's always revival, maybe every month or every two, two months. Or maybe there's even a particular Sunday that is revival Sunday. <laughs> you know, revival is not a crusade for sinners. A revival is a move of the spirit. That unleashes on God's people an insatiable longing for supplication. That's one of the definitions of revival. Especially in our own context. It is a move of the spirit that unleashes on God's people an insatiable longing for supplication. It means you cannot separate revival from prayers. 
And let me also say this, I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but it's very important I say this right now, that a revival is not the sovereign act of God. Anywhere you see revival taking place, there are bended knees in secret asking for it. God doesn't just revive people. Neither does God just revive things in the lives of people. In spite of the prophecies that may have gone ahead. I hope you also know that prophecies don't fulfill themselves. The Bible tells us from Genesis, when man fell, God said that the seed, right, of man will bruise the head of the serpent. He was talking about Jesus in prophecy. And scripture says that the Lamb of God was slain from the foundations of the world. But Jesus did not show up in bodily form until thousands of years later when a man and a woman were praying in the temple. So even the coming of God himself to save mankind was impossible until people started praying. The children of Israel had been in bondage, in slavery for so many years. God already told Abraham, your descendants are going to be in slavery, in bondage for this number of years. But they exceeded the numbers. Until one day, Moses was going about his business. And the Bible says that he saw a burning bush to get the attention. God wanted to get the attention of Moses. And God said to him, I have heard the cry of my people. Now I am sending you. It simply means if there is no crying, there will be no sending. If nobody gets on their knees to pray and to place a demand on what Christ has made available on Calvary's cross, we may be celebrating revelation but never see manifestation. We live in a generation where, as it were, there is no, you know, um, bankruptcy of insights. Almost everybody has a revelation. But you know what this generation lacks? Manifestation. Because the fact that you know something does not mean it is reflective in your life. You may know it and not be a sign of it. That's why I love the scripture that says that I am my children. We are for what? We are for signs and for wonders. Such that there is a level you get to in God that you are not only sharing testimonies, you become the testimony. And I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice that as we step into this second half, that will be your testimony. In the name of Jesus. That you will not only celebrate signs and wonders. You will be the sign and the wonder. In the name of Jesus. So a revival is principally provoked. Through prayer. And that's why one of the things that characterizes Kodre revival is prayer. And I hope you are ready to pray tonight. We're going to pray. So revival is provoked principally through prayer in case someone is wondering do i really need a revival how do you know when you need one number one when religion and business for god has taken priority over prayer and word study how do you know when you need a revival number one when religion and business for uh, you know when religion and business let me just put it that way has taken priority over prayer and word study when religion and business has taken over the place of prayer. You know, you can get so busy that not reading the Bible becomes excusable. <laughs> and as a believer, you need to understand that the source is always the sustainer. You came from the word, the spoken word of God. You can only be sustained by the word. You can only be sustained by the word. So when you realize that you have gotten to a phase in your life, where you can go days, weeks, without a time of separation. Not congregationally now, but individually. Where there is no time of prayer and there is no time of personal study. You need a revival. May I say, the average person living in a metropolitan city like ours needs a revival. Because oftentimes you wake up early. And you get back home late. So when you realize that you have become so busy. And you see, busyness can also be even with service. You can be busy doing the work of God. Serving in church. Singing. Ushering. Uh, doing whatever. In fact, you can be so busy preaching. That you don't study the Bible. 
You know, there are preachers that only preach when they want to preach. They only study the Bible when they want to preach. Oprah, my son, Bible. They open to look for a message. Nah. It ought not to be so. It ought not to be so. When do you know when you need a revival? Number two. When you notice in your life an apathy towards the things of God. When you notice in your life an apathy towards the things of God. When you notice that the things of the spirit no longer interest you. Ah, it's a sign that your spirit is dying. Because that's another thing a revival is. A reawakening of the reborn spirit. That's why Jude 20 says, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. And that word building up yourself, right, is the word that means to recharge yourself. Because no matter how well charged the battery is, huh, it's going to run out. It's going to run out. It's going to run out. So, oftentimes when you realize that you are already losing passion for the things of the spirit, it's simply because your spirit man has not been recharged for a while. That's why in Psalms 110 and verse 3, the Bible says, in the days of his power, his people shall be willing. Another translation says, his people shall be enthusiastic in the days of his power. 110, Psalm 110 and verse 3, in the days of his power, his people shall be willing. KJV, All right? <laughs> A guy chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, Thus speaketh the Lord of all, saying, These people say, The time is not come. The time that the Lord's house shall be built. Why did they say that? They have lost passion for the God that they served. When you lose passion for God, you will lose passion for his house. It's automatic. That's why it was said concerning Jesus that the zeal of your house has consumed me. So that's one of the ways to detect when you realize that, you know, some people even say with pride, I, I remember the days when I used to pray. So what are you doing now? I, I remember those days when I will read the Bible. I will read 10 chapters. So what are you doing now? <laughs> Maybe you've not even opened the Bible since this second half began. <laughs> and that's why I said, when you notice business has taken the place of prayer and what study, not prayer or because they work hand in hand. Number three, how do you know you need a revival? When you have an increase in knowledge, but very little results. When there is increase in knowledge, but very little results. Second Timothy chapter three and verse seven, it says, "Ever learning." And never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. A lot of people have knowledge but little transformation. They know so much. They are Jesus babies. But there is no reflection of Christ. How many of us know what I'm talking about? Jesus babies everywhere. But you are wondering, is this one a Jesus baby or the devil's baby? Because there is so much knowledge. They can even have Bible study. And have a followership. But there is no sign of Christ. Because when there is transformation, it will be visible. Am I making sense? Because transformation starts from the inside out. Anybody can do anything on the outside. If you have been truly transformed, you will see it on the outside. Because it started from the inside. How do I know I need a revival? Number four. When sin and carnality multiplies on a massive scale. When sin and carnality has multiplied on a massive scale. Let me make that practical. When grace has become an excuse for living anyhow, there's need for revival. There's need for revival. Many of the things that people talk about today from the pulpit and they get away with it. If you did try it 20, 30 years ago, they can stone you on that altar. So people begin to speak grace. And they say, no matter what I do, grace covers it. Ah, you know it's because people's spirits are dead. Because even if you don't know the word, there is a level you get to in your work with God. Even if you don't know a particular scripture that addresses that thing. That when you're about to do wrong, the Bible says the love of Christ constrains us. 
You may not be able to explain why, but something just withdraws. You know that, and I don't know why, but I'm not supposed to be doing this. Where has that gone to? So when you notice in your life, you did not used to lie. Now, lying has become second nature. You lie and you kiss yourself. Ah, you bad man. <laughs> you are so creative, you didn't even think about it. It's as natural as breathing. The first time you lied, you felt bad. Now you lie and you say grace. <laughs> when you find yourself in situations like that, there's need for revival. When there is no difference between how you conduct your relationship as a single, between how unbelievers conduct theirs, there is need for a revival. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There is, there is, in fact, it's a state of emergency. Isaiah 26 and verse 20. Isaiah 26 and verse 20. He says, Come, my people, enter down into your chambers and shut your doors about thee. He says, Hide yourself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. I don't know if media can help with that. Isaiah 26 and verse 20. If you can't help with it, just write down that scripture and please read it when you get home. It will bless you. Read it in as many translations as possible. Isaiah 26 and verse 20. What's that scripture trying to say? There are times when you must hide yourself for certain things to happen in your life. See, everything you see manifesting on the outside started in the secret place. It started in the secret place. It started with somebody hiding themselves. They say champions are not made in the ring. They only recognize them. If you see a champion, someone that came out successful in anything, it's because they paid some price in the private. Nobody gets to become a champion, great in life, great in destiny, by what they do in public. That's why in life, you must be more disciplined in private than you are in public. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. What did he say? Hide yourself as it were. For a little, a little moment until the indignation is passed. So what we're doing in these five days is like hiding ourselves. Shutting ourselves up in our chambers. Because we will not always do this. But there are times in your life when you must always separate yourself. And that consistently. For us as a church is in the beginning of the year and in the middle of the year. We do that consistently. In January, we do that for 12 days. In the middle of the year, right? We do it for five days. Why? Because the scripture tells us to do that. You can't keep living your life, just living it without having moments of separation. Oh no, it's not going to work. When you study the life of Jesus, there were several times Jesus will hide himself. People will come to him and say, Ah, master, the people are looking for you. He said, no. This is not the time to attend to people. This is the time to go into the private chambers. If you are always out there, always giving out, giving out, giving out, one day you will get to a point where there will be nothing to give. Where there will be nothing to give. And I pray that everything that God wants to pour into us in the next five days, may our spirits be open to receive them. In the name of Jesus. Please friends, there are some things I'm going to be talking about in these five days, especially beginning from tomorrow. Right? Because one of the things that God impressed upon my spirit is that in this year's Code Red Revival, that should talk about the things that need to be revived. One of the things I'm going to talk about, especially in a way you may never have understood before, right, is a revival of, not just prayer, but a revival of spiritual warfare. This generation has become so contemporary. People even say, you know, Jesus has fought on my battles. Really? No wonder there are little manifestations in your life. He has, not, he has given you the victory. But you need to lay hold on the victory. I mean, I say spiritual warfare is not when you see every lizard and you say they have come. That's not spiritual warfare. Because many do spiritual warfare from a wrong standpoint. And that's why they still end up being defeated. Jesus Christ is the same today. Right? It's same yesterday, today, and forever. So that simply means there is no upgraded Christianity. 
Christianity cannot be upgraded. So can't say, oh, now we now have the higher revelation. There is nothing like that. A higher revelation, we now, we now, we now see it in this way. <laughs> if that's not what the Bible says, that's not what it says. You can't read your meanings to scriptures. Tonight, specifically, as instructed by the Spirit of God, I want to teach on what I've titled Creating Your Own Miracles. Creating your own miracles. Creating your own miracles. How many are trusting God for a miracle in this season? Hallelujah. You know, the amazing thing about God is He doesn't just want us to seek miracles, He wants us to be creators of miracles. Psalms 103 and verse 7. The Bible says he made his ways known unto Moses. But he made his acts known to the children of Israel. The acts were the miracles. The ways were the principles. Moses understood how to create miracles. That's why every time the children of Israel needed a miracle, what always happened? They cried out to Moses. Not to God, but to Moses. The reason Nicodemus came to Jesus at night was because he saw something he had never seen before. Do you know Jesus was not crucified because he was the son of God? He was crucified because the Pharisees and Sadducees, they saw something in his life they didn't see in their own life. Said, if this guy continues this way, he's going to take over the whole city. They killed him more from envy. It was more a political move, not a spiritual move. But God used it to further his own agenda for the redemption of mankind. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. He says, no man can do these things you are doing except God is with him. And Jesus said, it's not about what I'm doing. It's about who I am. It's because I know certain things. He said, if you can also walk in the same dimension, then you'll be able to create what I'm creating. You'll be able to do it. You see, miracles are not, you see, what we call miracle is not a miracle to God. I hope you know that. I hope you know that when we celebrate miracles, God is not in heaven saying, ah, ah. It happened though. Miracles are God's normal. And that is the dimension God expects every one of us to walk in. Why? Because Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28, the Bible says that, you know, let's have it on the screen. It's a popular scripture, but it's good to read it again. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Then God said, let us what? Make man in our own image. Let's read together out loud now. According to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let's stop there. It says, let us create man in our own image after our own likeness. What that simply means is, let us make another species of beings that can function exactly like us. That's what that means literally. That will be able to operate like us. That will have dominion. See, many of the things we call miracle is simply the expression of dominion. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Many of what we describe as miracles is simply the expression of dominion. So, maybe somebody gets healed. That's dominion over sickness. Someone gets a financial, you know, maybe experiences a financial intervention. That is dominion over heart's resources. So, living in the miraculous should be a natural thing for a believer. That's why when Jesus was walking on water with the disciples at night, and the Bible says they were scared, and Peter was the only one that was bold enough to say, Jesus, if you are the one, tell me to come. Jesus did not say, you better respect yourself. Are you Jesus? You better stay there if you don't want to sing. What did Jesus say? Come. If I can do it, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. That's why it says, this sign shall follow them that believe. Not preachers. He said, this sign shall follow them that believe. If you believe it, you can experience it. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? So the level and dimension God wants every one of us to operate in is the level whereby we are able to create our own miracles. Matthew chapter 13, verse 16 to 17. Jesus said, blessed are your eyes for the see and your ears for the hear. He says, for verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them. He says, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. So what Jesus was trying to say is, under the New Testament, 
there are things that you begin to walk in that even people like Elijah people like Daniel and all those powerful guys under the old covenant they didn't have the privilege of stepping into I hope you know that in the old testament they didn't have the holy ghost on their inside like you and I have today that's why the holy spirit is not just meant for speaking in tongues right it's more than that under the old covenant the spirit came upon them in the new testament he lives within us and the bible says if that same spirit that raised christ up from the dead dwells in your mortal body it says he will quicken you that same spirit not a second version not a reduced version the same spirit the holy ghost that raised christ from the dead the bible says that same spirit is on the inside of you it's on the inside of you i want you to repeat after me say i have the holy ghost on my inside say the same spirit that raised christ from the dead dwells on my inside it's the same it's not another version it's not a secondary version it's not an old model version it's the same it's the same that's why jesus said this sign shall follow you the same signs in fact when the disciples said you are not going anywhere you will stay forever. He said, ah, you guys don't understand. He said, it is beneficial for you that I live. He says, it's beneficial. He says, because when I go, he said, the Holy Spirit will now come. Now, if I need to perform a miracle, I have to be there physically. If I need to get to Jairus' house, while the daughter is still sick, and the woman with the issue of blood interrupts me in the way, the girl will die. Why? Because I can't be in two places at the same time while I'm on the earth. But if the Holy Ghost comes after my ascension, if a believer is at Jairus' house and a believer is with a woman with the issue of blood, nobody needs to switch places. Anybody can perform that miracle. That's why when you study the life of the disciples after Jesus ascended and they received the Holy Ghost, most of what Jesus did, they did. Jesus raised Jairus' daughter. Peter raised Dorcas. The woman, right, that, that, that took care of the widows. After she died, the people came to Peter and said, you know what? She cannot die. Let me tell you this. As a believer, there are things that the world expects from us. Why did they come to Peter? Because they have seen him walk with Jesus. You cannot be with Jesus all these years and not be able to do what Jesus did. People may not tell us. But deep within their spirit, there are places when you show up, people believe that the solution has arrived. With all this, your prayer, with all this, your fasting, with all this, you're going to church. What betide you if your life is still ordinary? Because it shouldn't be. In fact, let me tell you this it is not. As you are right now, as a believer, your life is not ordinary. You are the only one that doesn't know. The devil is aware. And you see, one of the things the devil is so good at is to trade in ignorance. That's one of his greatest strategy. To trade in ignorance. So, an area of ignorance is an area of affliction. If you can get light, that's why Jesus said, blessed are your ears for they hear these things. Blessed are your eyes. Why? Because they see these things. I want us to read from John chapter 2 tonight. I'm going to take my text for the discourse from there. John chapter 2. I'm going to use that scripture for the remaining time that I have. And then we'll pray. John chapter 2 and verse 1 to 11. John chapter 2. Verse 1 to verse 11. We're going to read it out loud together in concert. Are we ready? You can clear your throat. Hallelujah. Are we ready? Let's go. And on the third day, there was a marriage in the canal of God. What's today? What's today? You know, it was when I was about to come out of the office. The Holy Spirit just brought it to my attention. It says, on the third day, there was a miracle in the kind of guy. He said, today is the third day. So it means today there will be miracles. In the name of Jesus. Oh, there shall be miracles. Somebody will get home and you will meet miracles. Somebody will wake up tomorrow morning and you will wake up to a miracle. What has been impossible from January till now, I decree and declare that in these five days, let the miraculous begin on your job, in your business, in your health, in your finances. Let the miracles begin in the name of Jesus. Please sit down. And 
the fourth day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there verse 2 out loud let's keep going and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage and when they ran out of wine the mother of Jesus said to him they have no wine Jesus said to her woman what does your concern have to do with me my hour has not yet come his mother said to the servants whatever he says to you do it now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece Jesus said to them fill the water pots with water and they filled them to the brim and he said to them draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast and they took it when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from but the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him every man at the beginning set out the good wine and when the guests have well drunk then the inferior you have kept the good wine until now that's 11 out loud this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed him I love the way the King James Version puts that verse 11 it said this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him number one how do you create miracles you need clarity you must know the area of your life where you are trusting God for an intervention when you look at the third verse I'm going to be making reference to that passage of scripture all through this message the third verse the Bible says and when they wanted wine did you see that they ran out of water the mother of Jesus May please switch to King James because my notes here is in King James I'm already used to King James vehicle for me to switch so I do more of my study in King James Verse 3 says, and when they what? Wanted wine. Wanted wine. Let me just stay there for a while. Wanted wine. So they knew what they wanted. The Bible says they wanted wine. Clarity of desire. Every miracle begins with a specific desire. Not a generic one. Many people always say, God, I want a miracle. What miracle? It always begins with clarity, specificity of intervention. Everyone that came to Jesus, Jesus did not assume what they wanted. He clarified what they wanted. A blind man came to Jesus. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? Ah, shouldn't you know? Somebody is blind. What should he need? But that's an assumption. Because the Bible tells us a man, by the gate called beautiful, he was at a beautiful place with an ugly experience. And the Bible says when they saw Peter and John, he did not desire to be healed. The Bible says he desired to receive money from them. Do you know there are people going through things and they don't want it to change? I hope you know. Oh, some of us don't believe it. Because, you see, <laughs> oh dear. I was reading one book many years ago, one of Kennedy Gaines books. And I was talking about a particular woman that came to the healing line. And was trying to pray for the woman. He said the more he tried to lay hands, he felt a restriction. It was as if the anointing was flowing back to him. And he asked the woman, do you want to be healed? And the woman was honest. She said, no. He said, because if I get healed, my children will not call me anymore. If I get healed, my children will not visit me anymore. She said, I love the attention my sickness brings. So sometimes you may see a need in people's life and they don't want that need to be met. Because there is something else that need is created. So Peter and John saw this guy. They had everything it takes to heal him. But the Bible says this guy desired to receive money. Hams. That's why in the ministry of Jesus, he never assumed what people wanted. You are blind? What do you want? You may also just want money. You may just want money. You may just want money. You may love the fact that people carry you every day and you don't have to go to work by yourself. You know it's easier to beg than to be responsible. You don't know? Just coming up with different strategies. Like entering the bus say your transport money is not complete and when people donate for you and the bus is about to move you act as if you have forgotten something you come down <laughs> you give the driver a share and you collect your share a lot of people who have experienced that that is easier but really is it not better to just experience the miracle of deliverance and just have a change of story 
That's why every miracle begins with clarity. The question tonight is, what do you want? That's the question God is asking you and I. What do you want? That's the reason why we all have, have an expectation card for Breakthrough Festival, right? And Kodre Revival. There has to be clarity. You see, documentation aids clarity. As you begin to write, you begin to ah, of a truth, what do I want? That's why I told us to prayerfully write our expectations. Not just, I want a car. I want this. I want. Everybody wants things. But what is your expectation? What is that thing that when God does, you'll be able to say of the truth, God is the doer of these things. For surely there is an end, the Bible says, and your expectation shall not be cut off. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. I don't know the things you have written on your expectation cards. But as the scripture says that for surely there is an end and your expectation will not be cut off. I decree and declare as God lives, every of your expectation will become a testimony. In the name of Jesus. Every of those expectations will become a praise point. In the name of Jesus. And it will be this year. This year. This year. This year. Somebody say this year. Yeah. This year. Not next year. Up next year. None of those expectations you have written down will be written on your Breakthrough Festival expectations. In the name of Jesus. By January you will have new expectations. Because everything you are releasing your faith for in this year's Kodre Revival will become a reality. It will become a testimony. Your eyes will see it. Your hands will handle it. If you believe it, say a very big amen. amen. So the first thing is clarity. Clarity. So the question is, are you clear about what you want? At this year's Kodre Revival. Are you clear about what you want in this second half? Are you clear? Are you clear? Are you clear about what must happen before the year ends? Are you clear about what must happen in your family? Are you clear about what must happen in your marriage? Are you clear about what must happen in your finances? Are you clear about what must happen in your health? Are you clear about what must happen in your business and in your career? Are you clear? Because that's the beginning of all miracles. That's the beginning of miracles. That's the beginning of miracles. God cannot move in an area where there is no clarity. Blind Bartimaeus came to Jesus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Mercy is not generic, it's specific. When eventually he came to Jesus, he said, what do you want? He said that I may see. Oh, okay, you know what you want. So receive your sight. Receive your sight. Some people, what they need is men. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The man at the pool of Bethesda, John chapter 5. Jesus said to him, do you want to be healed? He said, I have no man. He must have said that because others were assisted to receive their healing through men. He couldn't carry himself. And there's a scriptural validation to that. The Bible talks about the particular day. Jesus was preaching in a house. The Bible says, and there were so many people in the house, so that there was no way to enter into the house again. But there were these four guys who had a friend. And they said, you know what? <laughs> Our friend may not have faith, but we have faith for him. The Bible says they got to the top of the roof and they removed it. We don't know whose house it was. But they didn't care about destroying someone else's house. Don't destroy anything else. <laughs> but they made sure they got what they wanted. Clarity. Clarity. May you enjoy clarity tonight. Number two is obedience to divine instruction. Obedience to divine instructions. Obedience to when first lady was you know doing the charge and she mentioned obedience. I said, Wow, she's in the spirit. <laughs> obedience, obedience. When you look at the fourth verse, <clears throat> the Bible says, Jesus said unto her, Woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour is not yet come. Verse 5 says, His mother said unto the servant, Whatsoever he tells you to do, do it. And here were six water pots, right? Because of time, let me just make reference. The Bible says Jesus told them, fill the water pots. And the Bible says they did what Jesus said. It's still a question I always ask myself. At what point did the water become wine? It doesn't matter. The most important thing is they obeyed. 
Was it at the point of when they poured it, when they poured water into the water pot, or was it when they were moving towards the MC, or was it in the mouth of the MC it changed? Because whichever one happened, it was a miracle. But do you know what? That miracle would not have happened if they did not obey that instruction. That's why Mary said, whatsoever he tells you to do, do it. Whether it makes sense or it doesn't make sense. And friends, let me tell you, many of the instructions that will change your life will not make sense. In fact, you will look at the miracle you are trusting God for, you will look at the instruction and it will not align. It will look like, like they say where I come from, kill and so, kill and so. That is, what do we want? What are they saying? It doesn't have to make sense. That's the way of the spirit. That's what the Bible says. The natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit of God. It says they are foolishness to him. Because sometimes it will sound foolish. Just like the prophet's widow. Going to Elisha. You told the prophet, my husband left us in debt. And he's not saying for you to get out of the debt, go and borrow again. It looks like this man is already losing his anointing. I know he's getting old, but maybe this one is dementia. Sir, is it that you did not hear me well? I said we are in debt. Say, no problem. So I'll go and borrow again. Does that make sense? But if you are going to experience the miracle of debt cancellation, obey. That's what Mary was trying to say. Whatsoever. Emphasis on whatsoever. Anything he says, whether you understand it or not, just do it. Just do it. Without obedience to instruction, forget everything called a miracle. Everyone that experienced the miracle in scriptures, every one of them, they were given an instruction. Everyone without fail. Whether it is as simple as picking up your mat, right? Or as simple as going to wash yourself in the pool, right? If you like, go and wash yourself in the river in your city. The one where you will get your healing is River Jordan. Or whatever river, you know, Elijah told him, that is Naaman. Naaman, you are sick, you have leprosy. It's not Elijah that has leprosy. It is you. It is you. Because you know when, I, I think, sorry, Elisha. When Elisha told him, go and wash seven times. You know what he said? He said, how can he tell me to go and wash in that pool? When there are swimming pools in a co-hotel, in Marriott. And not telling me to go to Mudubalu, I guess, house swimming pool. <laughs> and the servant says, sir, you are the one that has leprosy. He's not the prophet. He said, if he had asked you to do something difficult, who don't you have done it? That's why, let me tell you this. Most of the instructions that will create your miracles are simple instructions that don't make sense. Not necessarily the difficult ones. They are usually simple, but it will not make sense. But they are always simple. He said, if he had told you to do something more difficult, who don't you have done it? I'm sure it now dawned on him to that. It is true. I would have done it. And you see, they told him to watch seven times. If I were God, to encourage him, as he did the first time, uh, the leprosy will be removing gradually. To encourage him to take the bath faster. But if you read the scripture, it was after he baited the seventh time that he received the miracle. So if he had stopped at number five, he said, this thing is not working, he would have died of leprosy. Obedience to divine instructions. And let me say this. Divine instruction comes principally through three channels. Number one is the word. Number one is the word of God. Hmm. That's why if you are not a student of the word, you are seriously shortchanging yourself. The word of God is not for pastors. It's for a believer. Every believer. How do you know what to believe if you are not a student of scriptures? How? How do you know what to believe? You will believe anything. You will believe every lie. Believe every deception. And let me tell you this. There are so many in today's world. So many. So many. In fact, there are people teaching deception that they themselves don't even know what they are teaching is wrong. Because they had it from people that had it who had the negative agenda in the first place. That's what Apostle Paul spoke about a set of Christians in Berea, the Berean Christians. He says anytime they hear something in church, you know, we go back to check if those things were so. Not that they didn't believe their pastor, right? But they wanted to come to the place of establishment. Because establishment comes through repetition. Through repetition. It's in the place of the study of the word, right? That your spirit man becomes receptive to instructions. To instructions. 
So instruction comes number one. Through the word. Number two. It comes through the Holy Spirit. Or what I call the inward witness. John chapter 16 and verse 13. The Bible says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear. He says, that shall he speak. And he will show you the things to come. When the spirit of truth is coming, he will guide you into all truth. That is, he will instruct you. When he comes, he will tell you what to do. So instruction comes, number one, through the word of God. Number two, through the Holy Spirit. The word of God, Psalms 19 and verse 105. I need to give us that scripture for those of us taking notes. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And, you know, when he talks about path, he's talking about direction. So the word, this word should direct you, not the opinions of men. Not the opinions of men. I remember a while back, you know, I was in a closed door meeting with my pastor and some people, you know, he is mentoring, you know, and fathering spiritually. And he was sharing some deep testimonies with us, some things that, <laughs> in today's world, you need to be careful to share publicly, you know. And you could see the question. You know, there are times when your face is a question, but you can't say it out of your mind, but how are you doing it? And he said, everything you see in my life today is by the word. Not gimmicks. By the word. I remember when we got this facility, you know, when we got the space, right? I remember he was standing somewhere there. It was a Sunday, the last day of Breakthrough Festival, I think 2022. He looked at me first, and first lady and said, don't do gimmicks. Just do the word. He said, don't do spiritual gymnastics. Do the word. Everything you need is in the word. The only thing that will last is the word. Styles will fade. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Styles will fade. People will come up with different styles, come up with different opinions. It will come, it will go. The only thing that will stay forever is the word of God. Because the scripture says that. It says, heaven and earth may pass away. It says, but not one jot of my word will go without being fulfilled. Isaiah 30 and verse 21. It says, and your ears will hear a word. Many of us quote it wrongly as many of, as um, you will hear a voice. It's not a voice, so it's a word. It says, and your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is what? The way. Jesus was not just a random person that get crashed the wedding. There was a relationship. The people at the wedding, right, had the connection to Jesus through Mary. That's why Mary said, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. And she left. She kept enjoying herself at the party. There was a relationship. Many are taught, not everybody can be instructed. There is a dimension of God's blessing and inheritance that comes into our lives through the teaching of the word. But let me tell you this, there is a higher dimension. When you get to a point where you can be instructed. Where you can be instructed. Where you can be instructed. So Jesus did not advise them Asama, if you really want to water, uh, maybe you should fetch water. He simply told them, do this, do that. Elisha was not advising the prophet's widow. When she needed to get out of debt, it was an instruction. An instruction. So, your instruction will come principally through those three channels. The word, the hymn word witness, that is the Holy Spirit, and number three, through your man of God through your man of God. But you know the reason many are unable to receive instructions from their man of God, familiarity. That's why the Bible says, he that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Because there are different ways you can receive the one God has sent to you. You can receive him as a colleague. You can receive him as a friend. That was what happened in the days of Jesus. In fact, you can receive him as somebody that you grew up together. That was what happened in the place where Jesus grew up. The Bible says Jesus could not do any miracle there. Not that he didn't want to. He could not. You know why? He said, like, ah, is this not Joseph's son? Are his brothers and sisters not here with us? We know him. Uh -uh. Uncle Chuku, have you forgotten that chair? He's the one that made it. Ah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Ah, he has grown up. He now has beards. Ah, ah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you have grown up. That's what they were saying was performing miracles everywhere doing wonders everywhere except in his own house except in his own house 
May your ears be open to hear instructions. In the name of Jesus. Number two. Sorry, number three. Step to creating your own miracle is desperation. And I hope there are desperate people here tonight. Desperation. Desperation. In the fifth verse of that same scripture, John chapter 2 and verse 5. Mary said to the servant, whatsoever he tells you to do, do it. Do you know what that means? We don't have any other option. Whatsoever. Whatsoever means whatsoever. If he tells you to go and look for 100 horses, <laughs> whatsoever. If he tells you to jump up 1 million times, whatsoever. So those guys were already prepared. Why? Because they were desperate. Many of us don't experience miracles because what we are releasing our faith for, we can live without it. Until you get to the point where you will rather not live than keep living without certain things. You may never see those things. That was what happened to Jacob. Jacob was going back home. His brother told him, the next time I see you, I will kill you. <laughs> and of the truth to his word. When he saw that Jacob was coming, the Bible says he went to meet him with 400 men. Who goes to receive a guest with 400 protocols? Because they were not people, they were not going to receive him. They were going to kill him. But the Bible says that Jacob was left alone that night. And he got into the place of desperation. He said, I will not let you go. Except you do something. Until you bless me. I will not let you go. That's the language of a desperate man. See, when you are desperate, you leave no options. If you are still at the state where, but if God wants to do it, it's fine. If he doesn't do it this year, no problem, there's still another year. <laughs> you will never see those things. Though. You will never see those things. Because that is where the devil wants you to be. If you are not spiritually desperate, you are spiritually complacent. That's what it means. That's what it means. Desperation. Desperation. The woman with the issue of blood, she had had that experience for 12 years. But a day came at the risk of her life because according to the Jewish culture, if you're on your period, you're not even supposed to be where people are. You are now trying to talk the only man, Jesus. <laughs> but she told herself, if I can just touch as weak as she was because if you are consistently bleeding you will be very weak the bible says against all odds she took the hem of Jesus' garment and she received that healing why? because she was desperate desperation does not consider what can happen desperation is only focused on what must happen that's desperation that's desperation if you are still thinking of her ah, you know, if, if I now pray like this who people be thinking I have a problem you are not desperate you are not desperate. You are not desperate. You know, when you see people that are desperate, you see it in their prayers. They are not conscious of who is around them. They are not conscious of title. They are not conscious of status. They just know that this time is my time. This season is my season. What God has promised must become my reality. This year will not end without certain things becoming a reality in my life. That's desperation. That's desperation. And the thing about desperation is nobody can be desperate for you. Desperation is individualistic. That's why a man can be desperate and the wife is complacent. A woman can be desperate and the husband is complacent. Just, ah, this is your stress is too much now. God will do it. No matter how much somebody loves you, they cannot be desperate on your behalf. Zacchaeus, a time came in his life. He has had everything, but he was desperate to see Jesus. Zacchaeus was a rich man. A rich man does not climb tree. You hire people to climb trees for you. But the Bible says this particular day, he heard that Jesus was going to pass a particular place and he climbed the tree. And when Jesus saw him, he said, come down today. Salvation has entered into your home. He was desperate. You know the reason why people don't fast? They are not desperate. They are still okay. Uh -uh. Fruits. Food. Oh, I'm not the one that killed Jesus. You are not desperate. Are not desperate when you are desperate, it will be time to break. You will not even remember to break. That's desperation. That's desperation. <laughs> I remember there were times in my life 
when I will pray, I will even forget to break. The only thing that will pass through my mouth was water. You see, there is nobody that cannot pray. You have not seen the reason to pray. That's why you are not praying. No, you have not seen the reason to pray. And it is better to pray as an offense than a defense. It's better that way. So tonight when we are praying, we will see the people that are desperate. <laughs> but that's not your job to not be checking who is desperate. It means you are also not desperate. If you can be looking around to be checking who is desperate, yeah, you are not desperate. Jabez was also a man that was desperate. The Bible says he was more honorable than his brethren. But you see, a desperate man does not live his life comparing himself to others. That's what I said. At least I'm better than my siblings. I better pass my neighbor. But that was not his goal. The Bible says he cried. He said, oh, that we enlarge my territory. The Bible says, and God had him and answered him and gave him his requests. He may have died at the level he was if he did not cry out for more. See, some of us, we have seen the move of God at the level. But that is not all God wants to do. You see, one of the things that can destroy your desire for more, it is not failure, it's success and comfort. Hmm. When you are still trying to climb out of lack, it's easier to pray. You can pray in the night when <laughs> there is no light and you can't afford the gen to put on overnight and everywhere is hot. You cuckoo can't sleep, so you just turn it into prayer. But when there is AC everywhere, ah, as the room is cold, your spirituality too can be so cold. I said, um, oh, do I really need to do all night? I'll pray in the morning. That's when people begin to give ideas that you know, it doesn't really matter whether you pray in the night. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But Jesus prayed all night. As a believer, there, even if it is once a year, there must be a time in your life where you say, you, see, you must just see some things in the world that say, I will do it. If you just prayed all night and I call myself a Christ follower, I should also, even if once in my life, I must be able to do it. That's how to live your life as a believer. If you are a Christ follower, the things Christ did, do it. Do it. He prayed all night. When last did you pray all night? My last. My last. And it's not like maybe somebody's doing you. Desperation. Desperation. What I'm teaching on tonight is a series. I'm trying to do it in one message. Because God has given me a message for each day. So I'm trying to skip so many things. Desperation. Matthew chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. I want us to see a desperate man. You know, it was because the friends of the crippled man, they were desperate. And I'm sure that desperation must have come from the man himself. Maybe the friends, I even thought about it. Well, let us go. There's no space. Maybe the crippled man couldn't walk, but he could talk. I said, guys, don't take me back home. Today is my day. Matthew chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. Matthew chapter, Mark, sorry. Mark chapter 10. Verse 46 to 52. Can we please have it quickly? All right. Can we all read it together? And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus thou son of David have mercy on me and many charged him that he should oh this be civil they don't shout like that here huh? now a kind of church they don't shout I just see there's a seal there's a hand they shout just whisper Jesus can't hear you you don't have to shout remember they are not the ones that were blind people will tell you calm down they are not the ones going through what you are going through the Bible says, look at the next phrase. Can we read together? But he did what? He cried the more. So instead of him to shut up, he increased the temple. He cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, do what? Verse 49. And Jesus did what? The first cry. Jesus didn't stand still. He kept going. It was the crying, crying, the crying of a great deal. The louder cry. 
that got Jesus' attention. And the Bible says, if when they told him to keep quiet, if he had kept quiet, that would have been the end. No miracle. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise. Look at the same people. They have changed. If you will be desperate to change your situation, people will change to how they relate. People will change how they relate towards you. Stop focusing on people. Hey, I don't like how somebody. When you change, people will change. When your name changes, how people treat you will change. When your status changes, how people treat you will change. Stop focusing on how people are treating you. Focus. Be desperate enough for a change. Verse 50. Verse 50, please. And he casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto you? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, your faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received the sight and followed Jesus in the way. Did you see that? The Bible says he threw away his beggar's garment. That's desperation. That I'm not going back to this life. He had not even received the size then. Chew it away. There's no more begging. Desperation. Number four, to create your own miracles. That's number four, right? Never despise the things you have and where you are. Never. John 2 and verse 6, the Bible says there were there six water pots of stone. After the purifying, the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or more firkins apiece, right six water pots we are talking about wine we are talking about six water pots the prophet's widow elisha asked her what do you have in your house said, i have nothing but thank god for prophetic instruction and prophetic connection elisha helped her to gain the proper perspective don't look at it and say it's just a jar of oil what you have is the key to the next it's the key to the next don't despise it don't despise it. You know the reason many of us have cut ourselves off from the miraculous? We despise where we are. Thank God for the things you are trusting him for. But at when last did you thank him for how far he has brought you? You just need to feed 5,000 people. Huh? And Andrew saw five loaves and two fishes. I said, what is this among so many? He despised what was available. But Jesus knew that's the key to the miraculous. Not despising where you are. You are trusting God for 10 million. You see 100,000. They say, ah, oh, thank God for the 100,000 of us. That 100,000 is some people's miracle. They say, 100,000 in 10 million. Where do I want to start from? You have started. What if you have zero naira? Or you check your account balance and you say minus 100. The bank is not even kind enough. There is nothing there. They still removed on credit the bank charges. Like the minute then something enters, that's the first thing they remove. Seven hundred thousand. What is this among so many? If you study just because of time, if you read that passage of scripture, the Bible says, "And Jesus took the five loaves and two fishes." Because if you keep it in the hands of Andrew, it will never multiply. It will never multiply. That's why Jesus had to take it away from him. The Bible says he gives, he gave thanks. How we know you are not despising where you are is that there is always joy in your heart. There's always joy in your heart. That trusting God for 10, you see only one. Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you. For how far you have brought me. I'm not thanking you for my current situation. I'm thanking you for how far you have brought me because I know you can see me. He that has made eyes, will he not be able to see? You don't see. What many people call prayer is complain. God, can't you see me? You are telling him he's blind now. God, see you. Hmm. Now like this, good day to be. You have not asked anything. You are only complaining. Number five, take action on every instruction given to you. Take action on every instruction. John chapter 2 verse 7 and 8. Verse 7 and verse 8. Verse 7 and verse 8. Look at what happened there. The Bible says Jesus said unto them, fill the water, the water pot with water. And what happened? And they filled them up to the brim. And they said unto them, draw out now and be unto the governor of the feast. And they did what? And they bear it. Did you see that? Fill the water pot. They filled it. Bear it to the um, MC and they bear it. Action. Action. Action.
compassion. If blind Bartimaeus had done nothing, he would have died being blind. And his miracle would have walked past him. I just said, God, why are you like this? Eh? Somebody was born blind and died blind. Is it that you could not intervene? But a day came that his miracle walked past him. Or a robot was the one who said, a miracle is either walking towards you or walking past you every day. Every single day. Every single day. See, <laughs> miracles only happen in the life of those who are having bias for action. If you do nothing, you will see nothing. Even the prophetic is activated by action. The Bible says that Elisha gave a prophetic word. By this time tomorrow, there will be so much abundance that the price of everything will crash. The minister of finance said it can never happen. Now lie. Now lie. Elisha said it will happen, but you will not see it. Or you will see it, but you will not taste of it. Guess what? For that prophecy to become a reality, the Bible says there were four lepers outside the gates. That said to themselves, why are we going to sit here and die like this? If we go into the city, we will die. If we go into this Assyrian camp, we will die. Whichever way, death is sure. <laughs> and the Bible says they walked towards the camp and they saw so much goods. The Bible says they went into one camp, took so much, ate so much, went into another one. Ah, at the point, they said to themselves, this thing is not for us. This is a provision for a nation, not for four lepers. The Bible says they now went into the city and told them of what had happened. That's how the second kings, right? And the miracle happened. What the prophet had declared. But it would never have happened if somebody did not take steps. That's what I've told us several times. The steps of a righteous man, they are ordered by the Lord. Not the sitting down, the steps. The steps. You've got to be taking steps. Oh, I want to do this this year. I want to, I'm trusting God for a car. I'm trusting God for properties. Have you taken the step to even find out how much they sell it? That's how miracles begin. You take the steps. You walk in the direction. The Bible says as the lepers, as they move towards the Assyrian camp, the Bible says God caused the people to hear the sound of an army. So what happened is as they took their steps, God amplified it. It is what you do that God amplifies. If you do nothing, God has nothing to amplify. If you want to see miracles in your life on a consistent basis, be a man and a woman of action. Always be on the move. Don't be sitting down doing nothing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Move in the direction of that expectation. Move in the direction of that desire. Elisha told the prophet's widow, borrow not a few, but go and do something. I'm not going to lay hands on you. Elisha could have done that. But guess what? That indebtedness would have come back. Because whatever you behave yourself into, you must also behave yourself out of it. If you get out of something through the miraculous and you don't learn how to sustain it, go and check. That's why people will receive miracle healings that they got into, sicknesses they got into through behavioral patterns. If they don't change their behavior, something worse always comes after that. And it's not the devil. It's not the devil. That's why he said to her, go and borrow. Do something. After the miracle was not activated, he said, go and sell. Action. Do something. Do something. Don't just sit down. Don't just sit down. The reason people get depressed is because they are not in motion. Depressed. They are pressing you. You can only press someone in motion. Someone that is stagnant. You can't press someone that is in motion. Go and check it. When people are depressed, their mobility has reduced. The movie has reduced. They are not doing much. They are so self, so self-conscious, so self-aware. One of the last things Jesus said to his disciples is, "Go, go into all the nations. Not send the word to the nations. Go, go. Look at your neighbor and say, go. Look at your neighbor and say, do something. Take action. Yeah, do something. Do something." A woman had the last meal. She was about to eat it and die. When Elijah showed up, the instruction was something that required action. He said, go and make for me first. Go and make for me first. The first thing he asked was, give me water. That one was easy. He said, ah, no, 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 no. So I said, go and make action. Something must. 
something must be involved. You have to take steps. When last did you take steps? When last? Oh, if you say, yo, my business is going to be global and you don't have passports. It will really be global in your dreams. Maybe the first action somebody needs to take now is go and get a passport. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Go and get a passport. They are, go and get the visa. Take the first step. Imagine if those guys had been asking Jesus, ah, huh. Uncle Jesus, is why, you know, in case we are forgotten, it's not ice water that is missing in the wedding. You know. It's wine, wine, W I N E. We know water and wine starts with the same word, the same letter. If they had been rationalizing, the miracle wouldn't have happened. Take action. No matter how small. Somebody said, and I agree. He said, we must not be afraid of moving slowly. We must only be afraid of standing still. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. By all means, keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving. Somebody say, I will move. I will take steps. I will take steps. Last but not the least, always acknowledge your source. That's number what? All right. Because I have to skip some things. Always acknowledge your source. John 2 and verse 9. As we get ready to pray. The Bible says, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not from where it came. Can we have that scripture on the screen, please? It's very important we see this. John chapter 2 and verse 9. John chapter 2 and verse 9. Can we all read it together? You can go to New King James if that's what works for you guys. It's the same thing. It says, all right, can we all read together? Want to go? When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water did what? They knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom. Others may not know how your miracle happened, but you must never forget through when it happened. The moment you stop acknowledging your source, friends, <laughs> it's easier to acknowledge God when you're among your colleagues, when you're still at certain levels. The moment you begin to rise and get to positions of power and significance, let me tell you this. You may look around you and there are few believers. That is when the devil wants to get you. So you now want to reduce God. Everybody is talking. You remove God from your statements. The master did not know how the miracle happened. But the Bible says the servants, they knew. Every other person may be confused about how you got to where you are. But you must never be confused. You must never be confused. You must never be confused how you got that job. You must never be confused how you got that contract. You must never be confused about how you got that financial breakthrough. You must never forget. You must never think it's because of your qualification. There are many people that are qualified. In fact, more qualified than you that does not have what you have. I've seen first class students that are jobless. Many. Not one, not two, not three. Smart people. But you look at their life, you're like, if what it takes to live like this is to have first class, may I never have it. It's not your first class. Even if it is your first class, who gave you the intelligence? Never forget. Never forget. The fastest way to cut off the flow of miracles is to stop acknowledging yourselves. Others may not want to hear it, but you must always remind yourself. That's why Daniel stayed relevant. He was in a godless nation, serving godless kings. Yet, he never forgot who lifted him. That's why when a law was created and said, nobody must pray to the God of Israel, at least for a while. You know, they didn't say forever, just for a while. The Bible says Daniel went to his chambers, opened his window and prayed towards Jerusalem. Why? Because he knew how he got to where he got to. You know the reason why you can stop certain things? You are not sure it's that thing that produces the results. Because nobody that is smart stops what is working. If you know that of the truth, you have come this far. You look at how you started your life. And you look at where you are right now. And you know that, hey, hey where I'm, I am right now used to be a prayer point. Oh, Father, I thank you. You know the reason your gratitude has reduced? You can't remember yourselves. 
They can't remember. So now they look, they look at you and say, ah, this mind is nice. So he's uh, oh, I'm just trying. You know, I engage in false humility. He said, no, you know, it's because we, we know how to preserve wine, you know. So, ah, why did you keep the best for the last? That is how we do, that's how we roll. You, that's how you roll you. In your mouth. In your mouth. You can't say, oh, it's God. You know, don't, and don't say it out of religion. You know, people just say some things. They say it, but they don't mean it. It's God, it's God, it's God. But what they are saying is, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. You say it and you mean it. That this can only be God. This can only be God. I remember I shared that with, you know, minister, and you know, th th that's one of the ways I acknowledge God. I remember the first time I gave a seed in seven figures. I shared it with minister Ezekiel. And for me, that day I could not be saying me. Because ah, I know where I'm coming from. Say me, I can give at once. Not that hotelie ejo. You know what that means? Not that you say, okay, God, I will do this. You now do it for two years. Even years ago, if I said, I will give in seven figures, I can't do it in three years. Say, God, me, at once. I acknowledge such things. Some of you, let me tell you this. What you are wearing now was once a desire. Before, you only had one shoe. In those little things. Is this person materialistic? I'm trying to make it practical for you. Now you can stand in front of your door. What do I want to wear today? Before you didn't have to think about it. You know what to wear. Because there are not too many options. But now you have become a big girl. So you are looking good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, it's just me. It's just it comes natural. You walk. It comes natural. Who gave you the natural? Let's rise up on our feet tonight. Oh, Father, we thank you. Can you just start out back?